The Right Royal Roundup. There we go. It is time for our Right Royal Roundup. And Matt Blinsky is a royal commentator, attorney, host of the Prevailing Narrative podcast, and joins us this morning. Morning to you, Matthew. Morning to you, Christelle. How are you this morning? Where are you? You're LA, right? Los Angeles, yeah, evening over here, but, you know, happy to go through the vortex into the morning with you fine people out in the, the United Kingdom. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Now, um, firstly, I've got to ask you, uh, because, of course, a lot of the front pages this morning that you're waking up to here in the UK, uh, Harry and Meghan's author's uh, cruel attack on Kate. There's an interview with uh, the author as well in the Sunday Times. Kate, she's been infantilised. William is a hothead who embraces dirty tricks. Charles is not relishing being king. That's made the front page of the banner of the Sunday Times this morning as well. Um... Harry and Meghan claim that they've got absolutely nothing to do with this book and um, they haven't contributed to it in any way, shape or form. Um, firstly, what is your reaction and how do you think these comments will go down in the States? I'm not, well, there's been an interesting trajectory of the narrative around the royal family in the United States over the past 12 months. Beginning of 2023, a, a media tidal wave around Harry and Meghan, and you did have a lot of sympathy for the couple because they, they the the narrative that they tried to portray through the Netflix show um, and kind of the victimhood narrative that they had, initially people were receptive to it. That went very quickly from receptive to rejected in almost a heartbeat as they it became very apparent that they were just playing into this narrative, exaggerating evidence of oppression or racism uh, or whatever the, the grievances they had against the royal family. And it became very obvious how much they were just trying to soak up all this attention. Um, South Park obviously went after them and, and lampooned them uh, aggressively. So now uh, after uh, their, their star fell very quickly out here in the States. So now this information Information I feel is going to be uh, is going to be received with a lot of skepticism. In that, with so many of the commentators and everybody who's looking at this situation, kind of pegging Harry and Meghan as the villain and their narrative on on very fr uh, flimsy premises over the last year or so, I, I think everybody's going to look at this this story and, and these revelations as kind of motivated reasoning or motivated journalism on behalf of the author. Because when Prince William and, and Princess Catherine have visited uh, the states in 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 recent times they've gone down really well haven't they i mean the states the people in the states have really loved them absolutely and they seem to for better or for worse they are portraying a more traditional role and and attitude of the british royal family more regal more respectful more respectable um in contrasting with harry and Meghan, who seem like uh the types of kind of media media hogs and media whores that you know the we've seen in the united states over and over again and sure they we may pay shrift to them and they may get some of that attention but they certainly doesn't garner respect when when do you think stateside particularly was the turning point in their popularity and the believing of their narrative. Um, was, it, was it the fact that people started to lampoon them or was it, because I feel like over here it was Spare, actually. I think a lot of people felt that a lot of what was written in Spare, which we were all waiting to hear about how terrible things had been for Harry. And actually, in my opinion, what Spare portrayed was obviously how terrible it was after his mother died, which we all knew anyway, but yes. what spare what we weren't prepared for was the gripes like his bedroom was too small when he was at a family gathering, or that, you know, William had taken the Mickey out of his snoring one day during an interview and he was very, very offended by that, or the dustbin that he had a conversation with at Courtney Cox's house after taking too many mushrooms and the dustbin answered back. So there were those sorts of things. But none of it was this horrific um, you know, the, the, these horrific stories of, of, of Harry having had this terrible, terrible life. Yes. Um, so I think it, that was where it, it happened over yeah. here. Hmm. Yeah, it, it did not match the the degree of their grievances, and it, right off the bat, their entire they were branding themselves just around the supposed harms visited upon them by the British press, by the rest of the royal family, and it was nothing but victimhood, and that can garner some kind of fake. 
uh, affection right off the bat because nobody wants to look like a bad guy in in criticizing someone who seems to be uh, have all these grievances who seems to have gotten the raw and you know uh, the raw end of the deal here. Um, but I think people were it was kind of just under their consciousness that this this was all fabricated that this was that there there was no substance to it. And I think as the Netflix as kind of um, the initial. Uh, uh, response and, and the visceral response to the Netflix show wore off. Um, then you had Spare, obviously, as you mentioned, the the facts and the claims by by Prince Harry did not match the degree and scope. There's just a misalignment between the level of their grievance and, and the acts that seem to give rise to those grievances. Megan then seemed to lean in and it, it become um, what, whatever, you know, the charm of her story and, and describing how she found herself uh, as this fairy, you know, this fairy tale gone wrong in the royal family that became very she she gave herself up very quickly that she was just another uh a, a, another person seeking the media spotlight then and yes the, the lampooning through south park really did them in because it, it, south park really expressed what so many people felt but couldn't quite articulate the ridiculousness of these people claiming they wanted all this privacy yet banging all this gongs and dri driving all this attention drawing all this attention to themselves while simultaneously claiming that all they wanted to do was be left alone and people saw that contradiction uh, and that hypocrisy and it was just so blatant once South Park exposed it. You know you're so right you use such a great expression about the visceral response because when I watched the Oprah interview I remember doing a phone-in straight afterwards saying my god well it appears there's fault on both sides and you have to admit that Harry and Meghan if the racism was was if there was this these disparaging comments about the colour of of, of Archie were, were saying, well, you know, that is clearly unforgivable, and my word, Megan was suicidal, and no one wanted to help her. But then, and the same with the, the, to the to a point, I mean, I was a bit sceptical by the time the Netflix documentary came out, but it was such a barrage of victimhood that by the end of yeah. it, you're a, you're a bit exhausted, and your visceral response is, God, you know, that, that they do seem to have had a tough time. And it's only when you then wade through it a little deeper and you look into some of the claims into some more depth and then you start yes. comparing some of their previous claims that you start to realise that it's a bit of a house of cards and it starts to fall. Yeah, hey, it's the reason in the legal system, right? Uh, uh, they give the uh, defendant the last word before the, the case goes to the jury, right? Because they don't want yeah, people do, and anyone who's hearing a story gets kind of caught up and absorbed in the emotional resonance of whatever they've just heard from someone who's claiming that something just happened, right? Then, of course, what you have to do is subject claims to scrutiny. So once people are able to get out of a bit of the fog from these emotional appeals by people like uh, Meghan Markle, and they kind of subject these things to scrutiny, they have a moment to dwell on it and then you know some people who are uh, a little more no nonsense like the south park guys for instance uh who are not good not uh, they're not easy dupes they're not people who are going to be easy easily fooled by these emo this emotional manipulation once that has a little time to soak in all of a sudden it, it, it's exposed very easily and i think that's what happened here okay well listen stay with us when we come back we'll talk more about these revelations from harry and megan's biographer and some of the reactions to some of this. We'll talk about how it's being reported stateside, if at all, that there are apparently two royal racists and uh, a couple of other royal stories as well, including the Crown being scolded by... Um, well, I'll tell you who it's being scolded by when we return right here on Talk TV. Morning. Still joined this morning by the royal commentator, attorney and host of the prevailing narrative podcast, Matt Belinsky, to uh, talk about these absolutely staggering revelations that have been uh, taken from Omid Scobie's new book. Omid Scobie, of course, always sympathetic towards Harry and Meghan, has been a spokesperson for them in the past and uh, has now uh, written this new book, Endgame, which, uh, uh, well, he's been dubbed their mouthpiece, I should say, uh, Endgame called Inside the Royal Family and the Monarchy's Fight for Survival. Um, Matt, the other thing we're hearing this morning is, uh, uh, just going back to the Netflix documentary and, and, and uh, regarding Harry and Meghan, uh, The Sun on Sunday, again, another newspaper that's uh, picked up on this story today, Charles, Harry is a fool furious king charles branded prince harry that fool after his youngest son savaged the royal family in his netflix documentary uh, that's how apparently 
the King reacted to Harry's decision to divulge this information. Now, my question is, if let's remind ourselves of the last book that Obed Scobie wrote, which was Finding Freedom, where Harry and Meghan denied repeatedly having contributed in any way, shape or form to that book, and then in the court documents, when they were suing the uh, mail over here regarding the letter that ended up in there from Harry's, from, uh, uh, that was written to Meghan's uh, father, um, court documents revealed that they had contributed to that book and claimed that they had forgotten. Because it's very easy, Matt, to forget to contribute to an internationally best-selling biographical book about yourself. I don't know if you've ever done it on a, on a, on a, on a day where you just forget that you've done that. Um, if I ever had the chance, who I would. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so do you think that this would be it? If, if it is proven that some of these quotes that I'm telling you about today, bearing in mind King Charles's reaction to the Netflix documentary, Prince William being hot-headed and playing the game, Camilla being, you know, devious and the like, uh, 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 Princess Catherine getting these infantilised behaviour and that she's just scared to do anything but grin to the cameras. If it ends up being revealed that Harry and Meghan are behind any of this, will it actually be their end game when it comes to their relationship with the royal family and potentially as well the American media? I would imagine so. Uh, but in fact, the, the American media, I think they're they're already done out here. I think this this was a really rapid fall. It was not just uh, the public opinion turning against them. It was also the revelations and and uh, with with the Spotify podcast um, that looked very unprofessional to people in the states because they they got a lot of money and when and uh, Spotify was very was very welcoming to people like Harry and Meghan and even to believe that they had a story to tell in the first place and warranted a, a big money podcast. And then when it was revealed that everybody at Spotify pretty much disavowed them because they didn't have anything to say, they didn't turn in any content and they had to kill the deal. And a lot of executives who usually hold their tongue on these things, very vocal about expressing and, and revealing that that uh, how, how dissatisfied and how unhappy they were with Harry and Meghan. After, since then, nobody's really paid much attention to them. I think they've been kind of grasping for some sort of relevancy and are a bit of a joke. And it seems like everybody out here is just waiting for uh, Harry to wake up from this psychological experiment. It feels like he's under right now and and throw his hands up and give him mea culpa and have a reconciliation with his family and get divorced. That's what most people out here in the States are waiting for. Um, and if it was revealed that they were lying about using this writer as a backdoor mouthpiece, it would only be further cement their their status as somewhat comical and a joke and no one, very few people would be surprised because there's an interesting cultural difference here in as much as you know one of the things i love about america and one of the things that i admire about america is that that uh, the idea that you're classless and if you want to go out and make your fortune and work your hard and you make a lot of money doing so that you're celebrated for that you're really people love that um but i get the impression and you can correct me if i'm wrong but if you go out and make loads of money and you haven't worked for it uh, you haven't put in the work then americans are quite culturally are quite unforgiving about that Yes, and also if there are certain expectations of you or if you made certain promises and you don't follow through, um, how, how these two were trying to portray themselves as having, they're trying to portray themselves as having worthwhile things to say. Oh, we deserve a Netflix documentary. Oh, we deserve a Spotify pod podcast. Um, and great, we deserve to have multiple books written about us. And then you kind of took a peek under the hood and you look, well, there's not that much that's really interesting about these people. Um, and so that... Uh, without a doubt, it was a little bit about whether it was unearned, and there definitely turned some people off here that, um, sim similarly to the, the hypocrisy about not wanting attention that the South Park guys uh, uh, exposed, the hypocrisy um, 
of claiming that they didn't want anything to do with the royal family, but then running this entire media blitz that was just about their experiences with the royal family. It's like, well, okay, you want to claim that you want nothing to do, that you, that you don't want any of the benefits from your past or from the affiliation with the royal family, yet you seem to be building entire content, uh, uh, kind of slate of content based just on your experiences with that. So so what is it? Is it just there's nothing interesting about the two of you with uh, outside the scope of your supposed victimhood from your past experiences with the royal family and i think that turned out to be true and it's this constant dredging of it all coming up yesterday morning we saw on the front page of the sun that apparently again now this royal racism story has been brought back up because somehow um the, the, these letters that were apparently written by megan to king charles on the subject have, have have emerged i mean goodness knows how they've managed to get into the media but they have and um so it, it's just the constant revisiting of these same old gripes, but not really yeah. enough information to actually exonerate anyone. Because what we don't know about this royal racism story, this alleged royal racism story, which they've now backtracked on, by the way, because in an interview that Harry gave for the book Spare, he actually said that they never claimed that it was royal racism. Uh, that it was unconscious bias, but they never ever put out a correction when everyone was calling it racism uh, until he had a book to promote. Um, but we don't know any context. We don't know whether this was a disparaging comment. We don't know when it was made. We don't know who made it. That puts everyone under suspicion. We don't know whether it was a, uh, uh, oh, I wonder who Archie's going to take after, but they're just dredging it all back up again. Yeah. Um, extraordinary claims require, require extraordinary evidence. And it's an extraordinary claim to say that, you know, this very well-respected family um, that is so revered, you know, engaged in kind of this really um, pedestrian type of racism just over having someone from a different background and ethnicity as part of their family so that everybody seemed to be wondering, oh, okay. It, it seemed the, the accusations right off the bat would seem to um, prove out some of the worst concerns about the royal family is that they're very reactionary and still living in the past and would not be accommodating to a person of another ethnicity then you're waiting for the other shoe to drop for megan to provide some sort of megan and harry to provide some sort of substance to these claims and you're expecting to hear terrible things and then they couldn't come up with anything all they seemed to suggest was that a couple of people had made vague references to the color uh, of their child and not even particularly min malignant ones. So yet again, a mismatch between the, sca the, the scope and the scale of the claim of the grievance and then the facts that are supposed to support And an actual fact of backtracking, because that's what happened when Harry was then interviewed by Tom uh, Bradby for, for a UK journalist for his book. Another contradiction, which they're full of. I mean, and this is absolutely staggering that um, yeah. Omid Scobie claims that it was William who, through his royal aides and press relationships, painted his younger brother as mentally fragile. Um, uh, 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 that's an, and no one knows, apparently, how involved William has been in many of the things that have gone out about his own brother. Um, it's not William, the, the now Prince of Wales, that has painted Harry as, as, as mentally fragile. Harry literally wrote an entire book where right. he spoke about his mental fragility, has given countless interviews, was the ambassador on, 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 of, of a charity that apparently did this because of his own experiences, has op spoken openly. He even did a, 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 a live book reading and, and promotional interview for Spare with a therapist, and then yes. he has the audacity through Omid Scobie, if we believe that there is a connection, though, of course, it's denied, that, that William has painted him as mentally fragile. I mean, do they think we're stupid? Uh, they, they must, because yet another glaring hypocrisy, like direct contradiction. It's not even it's not even tangential. It's not even diagonal. It's like literally the same thing with their, their um, hemming and hawing about privacy while they draw the, all this attention to themselves, um, trying to once again paint themselves as victims in that other people are questioning their mental strength while they or, you know, their their uh, the status of their mental health when their entire brand is built around trying to 
uh, trying to normalize and trying to flaunt their supposed neuroses and talk about, you know, and, and portray themselves as more humanitarian or more substantive or better people because of their willingness to talk about their mental health struggles. We're like, this is the brand you built. This is what you guys wanted. This is what you guys have made yourselves about. You've made yourselves about, about therapy. You've made yourselves about talking about and flaunting your, your inner world and your neuroses and your, your concerns. And then if people are just going to uh, reflect that back to you, or notice their they just seem to expect people not to notice what they're doing themselves it's it's i think that this might be the end game for harry and Meghan when it comes to their relationship with the royals but of course um another interesting aspect to this which some people would call a contradiction and that is the comments this week of um the former queen elizabeth ii um press secretary dickie arbiter and He's been particularly critical of scenes in which Prince Charles breaks the news of Diana's death to her sons in the Netflix series The Crown. Um, he has said the sequence of Charles telling his sons of their mother's death was so insensitive and was so unnecessary. The death of their mother is still raw with both of them. Um, and, you know, the scenes between Charles and his mother in which he blurted out that he, she wanted Diana to come back in a Harrods van were absolute nonsense. So, you know, it, it was, there was a lot of dramatic licence used for that. Um, firstly, do, do you think that, that any of that... I mean, The Crown is a huge hit, both here and in the States. Do you think that viewers in the States watch it as... Two questions. Do you think they watch it and think, oh, yeah, this stuff all definitely happened? Or do they appreciate the dramatic licence? And secondly, how do some of these perhaps more um, dramatic moments that some might find a bit tasteless, how does that sit with Harry taking millions and millions of pounds off Netflix? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think American audiences at this point understand kind of inherently, once again, you, they, anytime you're watching something, you're going to assume whatever you're watching, if it's claimed to be based on a true story, that it has some basis in fact, while still at the same time understanding that uh, these dra dramatizations of uh, non-fiction or real life events very often uh, take traumatic license or exaggerate or based on rumor or innuendo. So I don't think it would come as a surprise to anybody that um a surprise to any american audiences that some dramatic li license was taken um and then also there is an expectation that things around the british royal family are always imbued with a little extra drama and a okay. little extra drama. so not at all shocking but harry has taken a load of money off that again that some would say well if he's if he's willing to complain about these things that are being said about him supposedly by William and the British press, but strangely silent when paid millions by Netflix about the, the, the movie that's, 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 that's being quite tasteless about his late mother. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just kind of, <laughs> funny that. It does feel like he's operating on principle, yeah. to say the least. It uh, feels like, you know, and that's something that, that would just, it, that was the stench of everything they were doing in the first place, from the Spotify deal. What on earth? What business did they have doing Matt, a Spotify? I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Listen, uh, the prevailing narrative is uh, Matt's podcast. Really good to talk to you and especially getting the legal perspectives from you as well. That's Matt Belinsky, Royal Commentator. Thanks for joining us, attorney and host of 